In this video, we're going to take a different view of the support vector machine, the dual view, and introduce the kernel trick. So the outline is we're going to briefly review the soft margin support vector machine that I left you with in the last video. Uh, then we'll talk at the very high level about primals and duals in, in the uh, context of optimization. Then we'll talk about the dual SVM and its derivation I will talk about the kernel trick, which comes from that derivation, and then we'll talk at, at a high. I'll introduce some very popular kernels, so the polynomial kernel, and the Gaussian radio basis function kernel, the RBF kernel. Um, but we won't go into how to compute those. I'll just introduce those, and then next time we'll talk about how to compute these. So last time I left you with this optimization problem, which is the soft margin primal SVM. So here we have, you know, a, a minimization over the, the w vector um, and some slack variables psi where we want to preserve these constraints that encourage the labels in the training data to be predicted correctly and this is the more general form uh, you know i originally showed you the hard margin form that required every data point to be exactly classified correctly um, but this is a generalization because you can mimic the hard margin by setting c to a really large value close to infinity, which will give a really huge penalty if you misclassify a point, which is basically the same thing as restricting it to, to have to classify each point perfectly. So we can call this f, or we can call the, the function we're optimizing here f, um, and we can say that its solution is w star. So if we plug in w star, we'll get the minimum score, um, and this whole thing is is f. So at this point we're going to talk about duality. So the idea in duality in the, in the context of optimization is that a lot of optimization problems can be viewed from two or more perspectives. So there's the original problem which we call the primal problem and then there's dual problems. There are actually many dual problems for any primal problem but we'll just think about one type of dual. And the idea is that if you solve the dual problem, you, you get information about the primal solution. And in fact, in this case, and in cases where you have something called strong duality, you, you can get exactly the primal solution. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to get the primal solution by solving the dual problem. So with that, we're going to derive the Lagrangian or KKT dual for the SVM, where KKT stands for some famous mathematicians, Karush, Kuhn, and Tucker, who developed a lot of theory for reasoning about these types of duals. So before I go through the derivation, I'll just show you the, the end result. And at the top, we have the primal SVM. This is the original SVM that we already saw. This is the, you know, the soft margin thing I showed you, where I slightly rewrote the, the constraints about the classification error. Um, but it, it's the same thing. I just moved things on to, I moved some terms over to the left side of the inequality. And on the bottom is the dual SVM that we're going to derive. And the dual SVM, the, the optimization is over some new variables, these alpha variables, which are going to be very similar to the Lagrange multipliers I showed you in the optimization video. But since they're going to be used to enforce inequality constraints, technically they're not Lagrange multipliers, they're KKT multipliers. This is a minor technicality. Everyone just calls them Lagrange multipliers, so I probably will too. But what you'll find, what you see here, is that it's just an optimization over the alphas, and it doesn't really even talk about w, uh, but there is a formula for computing w from the alphas down the bottom. So the first step for getting from the primal to the dual form is we're going to look at the primal problem and look at the constraints of the problem. And we're, we're essentially, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to try to remove those constraints, or we're going to replace those constraints with this idea of a, of a an adversary who's trying to maximize the function while we're trying to minimize it. Um, so it looks something like this. So you can see here we, we're going to formulate a, a new function that's a function of not just w, wb, and psi, but also of alpha and beta. And these alpha and betas are going to enforce the different constraints. So the first constraint we're going to be concerned with, with and the main constraints we, we think about when we do this type of optimization is the, the correct classification constraint. 
which I've highlighted in yellow, right? This is saying that we want to classify all the data points by at least some margin, um, and we may give it some slack on that. So we enforce this constraint by adding these terms into the Lagrangian expression on the bottom, where now the advers adversary is going to look at this function or look at this term and say, well, if, if, we, if we violate that constraint, the adversary can set alpha to some value to really maximize the function and, and, and make us pay when we're trying to minimize the function. Um, and then the other constraint we want to worry about is, I highlighted in green, is the constraint that the psi values have to be non-negative, right? They have to be greater than zero. And once we've done that, once we've formulated the Lagrangian, which now has these penalty terms and these uh, KKT multipliers or Lagrange multipliers, we can remove the constraints on W and Psi that we originally had. And in fact, you can see here, we've written it so that W and Psi are completely unconstrained. And that inner maximization is the only thing that's keeping the constraints satisfied. So again, if the adversary sees that we've violated the constraint that's in this parentheses here, it can wiggle the alpha parameters to really make the function really huge, which throws off our plans of trying to minimize the function. And we should take a minute to make sure that all of the signs are in the direct in the right direction. So let's let's run a thought experiment. So so suppose the the constraint is violated, meaning that you know this uh, this this quantity uh, y i times w transpose x i plus b uh, minus one plus psi. Suppose that's that's a negative value, right? Which means that we didn't classify correctly, and we're losing by more than the slack is allowing us. And just for the sake of simplicity, let's say the value is minus one. So if that's the case, then the adversary has to has this term to play with on the left, the you know minus alpha times minus one, and alpha is constrained to be non-negative um, in the optimization in the primal problem. So that means that the adversary can set alpha to a really large positive number, making the whole objective value really large, uh, and we lose the game as the min player. Conversely, if we did cor correctly classify this data point, we would have a positive value here. Um, and no matter what the adversary sets alpha to, unless it can go negative, which it can't, it's restricted to a non-negative value, it can't maximize the function any more than if it just set alpha to zero. And the same exercise can be done um, with the beta Lagrange multipliers, which enforce that psi itself is going to be, have to be greater than zero, or if it's less than zero, the adversary can mess up the minimization again. So just to recap, so far all we've done is reformulate the constraints to turn it into a, a min-max problem where we have an adversary who essentially just penalizes us arbitrarily bad if we, um, if we do violate, violate the constraints. So this is still the primal problem. So to get from the primal problem to the dual problem, we do something pretty simple, which is we look at this min-max problem and we flip it around and turn it into a max-min problem. Right? So here, now the minimization is now the inside, now on the inside, and the maximization is now on the outside. And it, as an aside, the reason that this is okay, that, we're, that we've done this and we haven't actually changed the solution, is because it's a special kind of duality where we have strong duality. And, and it's not always going to be the case that we can do this, but in this particular case, we can. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this dual problem and try to simplify it. Because it's, it's pretty nasty right now, right? There's this long Lagrangian equation, and we have this min-max saddle point optimization. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to borrow some analysis from the KKT uh, scientists who figured out certain conditions that have to be true at the solution to this max-min problem. So these are called the Karush kuhn tucker conditions or the KKT conditions. And they say that at the solution, we will provably have stationarity, number one, which says that all the gradients for the primal and dual variables will be zero, which you know, intuitively means that none of the players, neither the, positive, uh, the, the minimizing player or the maximizing player, can wiggle their, their parameters and, and score any better than they currently are scoring. 
So we have stationarity first, then we have primal feasibility, which says that the constraints on the primal problem will be satisfied. So the original constraints that we had in the primal problem will be, uh, will be satisfied. And then we have dual feasibility, which says that the constraints on the dual variables, which are really simple, uh, that, that they will be satisfied. So the constraints on the dual variables were just that they're non-negative. So they'll be satisfied. And then lastly, we'll have something kind of exotic called complementary slackness, which says, uh, I'll just read it, it says, for all inequality constraints, either the KKT multiplier will be zero or the constraint will be at equality. So the constraint will be tight. Right? And, and, and here we're introducing no, uh, terminology about inequality constraints, which is fairly intuitive, which is that you know if you think about an, an inequality constraint, it can be satisfied by a lot, or it can be satisfied by a little. And uh, what that means is, you know, if you say that x has to be greater than zero, well, if x is a million, then it satisfies that constraint really easily. But if x is actually equal to zero, then it's a tight, it's a tight inequality constraint. So complementary slackness says that either the KKT multiplier or the Lagrange multiplier will be zero, or the constraint will be equal, right? That x will be equal to zero in that example I just gave. Um, and for our analysis, we're going to mostly look at stationarity and complementary slackness. Right? Primal and dual feasibility, we're going to, we're going to depend on those two, but, but those are just nice properties we'll have. We're going to have to actually do some mathematics around the stationarity concept and the complementary slackness concept. So let's bring back our Lagrangian. So this is our, our equation that we want to reason about using the KKT conditions. Um, and Let's just draw a line to separate things. So let, the, let's think about stationarity. So stationarity said, again, that the, the gradients will be zero for all the free variables. So let's look at all the free variables and take the gradients. So first there's, uh, we'll, first we'll take the gradients, then we'll, we'll, we'll manipulate the equations to get some consequences that come from this stationarity requirement. So the gradient of this big Lagrangian function with respect to w is just going to be w minus the sum over all data points of, of alpha times y times x, uh, sorry, alpha i times y ti yi times xi. Um, and we can, you know, if we know that's, that's going to be 0, then we can solve for w, uh, which is exactly going to be the sum of all the alpha parameters times all the labels times all of the x's, all the features. And so that's our first consequence of the KKT condition uh, the KKT stationarity condition. Now the second consequence is going to come from taking the derivative with respect to b. Um, so b is just a scalar, so we just take a, a well, I wrote it as a gradient, but it's really just a derivative. Um, and that tells us, or that, that derivative is just minus the sum of alpha times y, the alpha times the y's. And if that's equal to zero, then that that, is, it, that itself is the consequence of the stationarity of the b variable that the essentially the dot product of the alpha vector t and the y vector is going to be zero okay then we'll also take the gradient with respect to psi uh, which gives us that c minus alpha minus b is or sorry beta is going to be um, zero which gives us two consequences which are totally equivalent, but, but it's convenient to write them in different ways. So first, we, we have a, a way of writing down alpha. So alpha can also be written as C minus beta, uh, where alpha and beta are both vectors. And beta can also be written as C minus alpha. So the, those are the same thing, but they'll be, it'll be, it will be convenient to look at them in both ways. OK, so those are the consequences of taking the gradients with respect to the primal variables, and that's going to be sufficient for now. Um, and let's just put them on the side and start ma massaging the equations using them. So the first thing we can do is we can look at the Lagrangian and, and just break, break up some of these, these products uh, just to make things a little bit easier to cancel things out. So if we look at that big sum over all the alpha variables times the, uh, you know, the constraint that things are classified correctly, we can break that up, break that apart into separate pieces uh, by distributing the alpha product or the, or the alpha from outside the parentheses into the uh, terms inside the parentheses and distributing the y uh, 
into the terms inside those the inner parentheses, and we end up with this. So we and we and we can break that up into separate summations. So you know you can pause the video and just work through the algebra to make sure I did everything correct. Um, but it's you know I didn't do anything fancy here. This is just distributing the terms and then breaking up the summation into the separate terms inside the summation. Okay, so now let's do some substitution using the KKT conditions that we did on the previous slide. So we'll do this one piece at a time. We'll look at the uh, the W um, term in the Lagrangian and substitute in its place the the equality or the the other definition that we got out of the KKT condition up on the top left. Um, and I'm choosing this particular w, w strategically because I've done this before and it turns out that this, at least for me, is the easiest way to make things cancel. Um, and then we'll also use another trick to simplify, but let me show you this first. So we end up with this expression um, where we've plugged in this, this sum instead of W. Um, and then we also are using another trick to, to remove this term completely. So this sum of alpha i, y i, uh, is is equal to this term on the left, which um, you know is equal to zero, so we can just get rid of that term. Okay, so let's make some more room, and now we can look at what's left, and this summation or this W product with the sum is actually very similar in form to this one over here, and things can cancel out nicely. You know, one half of this uh, minus the full thing of that cancels out to minus the term, uh, sorry, minus one half of the term. And then we'll use one other trick just to, you know, do more than one trick at a, at a time. We'll plug in for beta over here the, the definition of beta that we have figured out from the KKT uh, stationarity. So we end up with this expression, right, where here is the, uh, you know, combined terms that were very similar in the top row. Uh, and then over here is the new way of writing beta without using beta, now using now in terms of alpha. And we can continue finding terms to cancel out. So within that the term I just showed you, there's a C, which multiplies by psi, um, which, or is multiplied by psi. And that's completely equivalent to this thing up there. And those terms exactly cancel out, right? It's minus, minus C times psi and plus C times psi. Um, so they completely cancel out. And then similarly, there's an alpha in here, which is a, you know, I guess it's a plus alpha because it's, it's a minus of a minus. Um, and that completely cancels out with this term over here. So those completely go away, uh, leaving us with just two expressions remaining. And we still have a W in there that we haven't substituted in yet. So we'll just finish up by doing that. So uh, here we again plug in what we know W to be, um, and we end up with this. Uh, which simplifies to, well, it doesn't simplify, but it expands to this big summation. And you can you can work that out if you think about what parts of that each matrix multiplies with um, what other parts of the matrix when you do that dot product. Okay, so that means, right, after all that simplification, we end up with this, I mean, it still looks scary because there's this uh, nested summation, right, sum over i and sum over j, but it's it's fairly simple, and we, we this is now our new objective function, so we actually want to maximize this with respect to alpha, right, this is the, this is now, for some reason, the, the, you know, what we've done has canceled out all the terms that have to do with our original minimization, and all that's left is the adversary's maximization game. And the idea is that the adversary just wants to find the alphas that maximize this thing, um, and, and that's basically it, right? So are we done? Uh, not quite, not, not yet. Uh, there's a, a few minor things we need to take care of that we have to clean up first. So the first thing is that there's one of the conditions that we got from the KKD stationarity uh, that we have to make sure we enforce. So this is this the fact that alpha times y is going to have to equal zero is a constraint. That's a constraint we're going to have to enforce. Um, and then also the fact that alpha is going to be equal to c minus beta when beta had to be a non-negative value. Um, you know, it's a little bit kind of a mind bender because there's a lot of negatives here. But what that tells us because 
c minus the positive value has to be equal to alpha, it tells us that alpha has to be less than c. Right? Every entry of alpha has to be less than c. So we're going to add those two constraints in, and we end up with this, uh, this form where I flipped the maximization over alpha into a minimization over the negative objective, um, and we get this. Right? This, is the, this, is, this is actually the, the dual SVM optimization. So that's great. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of the really exciting things about this this transformation is that we took this, you know, fairly complex uh, primal SVM problem that had that had all these constraints that had to do with every data point and wanting to classify each data point perfectly, um, and we replaced it or we we formulated this dual objective function where the constraints are just these box constraints, right? The constraints just care about whether alpha is between zero or c. And in the uh, un uh, the, the the hard margin case where c is infinity, it just requires that alpha is greater than zero. So that's really great. And then, you know, one question or what, the next important question is then: Let's suppose we solve this problem. Suppose we find an optimal alpha. Well, how do we get w and b out of that? Uh, well, the way you get w is by looking it up from what we've already figured out on the top. Uh, so we just set it equal to the sum of alpha times all the y's times all the x's, and that's not too bad. But now we have to do a little bit more thinking to figure out how to, how to compute b from the alphas. Um, and the way we do that is by exploiting the complementary slackness uh, requirement of the you know, KKT conditions. So remember, remember, at the solution, all the KKT conditions have to hold, and complementary slackness says that um, the constraints have to be tight or at equality if the KKT variables or the Lagrange multipliers uh, are, are, are not zero. So what we can do is we can look for a, so one, of the, one of the entries in our data examples where the alpha, the KKT multiplier alpha is within the bounds, within the box bounds, so not at C and not at zero. And then we just need to solve a, single, a simple equation, just one equation. Um, which, you know, you can just work out the algebra becomes this. So this tells us that the solution to B is yi minus the sum of the alpha variables times the y's times the x's, which actually is w, times that xi for some xi where the alpha is between 0 and c. And in practice, this gets a little bit tricky because sometimes you can't tell if something is really at zero or if it's just numerically close to zero. Um, so usually a, a common trick is to find a bunch of examples of this and take the average estimate of B. And hopefully most of them are very close to each other. So that's it. These two things colored in yellow and green are the, the whole dual SVM. Um, so here it is again in, uh, in comparison to the primal form. And just this dualization by itself has a lot of benefits. You know, I talked about the box constraints being easier to work with than the you know crazy linear constraints that happen with each each data example on, in the primal form. Um, but there's also another really important benefit to the dual SVM. So for the next few slides, we're going to finish up by talking about this this new benefit. So let's look at the dual SVM by itself. So we put away the primal for now. There's not, the primal is not necessarily worse than the dual, but it doesn't have the advantage of this trick we're going to use. Um, and for just to make everything work out nicely, I'm going to I'm going to rewrite something. Uh, I'm going to write the prediction function. So f of x is equal to w transpose x plus b, which based on our definition of w is um, you know this summation, this term over here. And, and with that, if we, if we have that, then we don't exactly need w anymore. We can just cross it out um, and just directly compute the, the prediction score using the alpha variables, using the dual form. So at this point, you know, this is still the same thing. This is still the dual SVM. But what we're going to do is we're going to look through the entire formulation of the dual SVM and see where does the feature vector x show up. You know where where do we look at the attributes of example of any examples of our data? So we see it at the very top here, right? So there's x i. Uh, we see x j over here, 
Uh, and then we keep scanning, there's nothing else until all the way down at the B, where we have uh, one here, xj and xi, um, and, then, and then in the prediction function, the f, we have an xi and some other x, some anonymous x that uh, is going to be whatever is the input to the prediction function. So that's, uh, you know, that's where, that, those are all the places where we look at the feature values, where we look at the data. Everything else is dealing with the labels or these dual variables. Um, and if you look at it, you'll you'll notice that there's you know there's a common pattern to every time we use the data in the dual SVM, and that's that we're always using them in these inner products with other variables with other examples, right? So xi is you know xi transpose xj shows up, xj transpose xi, which is the same thing, shows up, uh, xi transpose x, which is uh, similar in form, shows up. So this leads to the trick that uh, that allows SVM to be able to to do learning with nonlinear uh, nonlinear decision boundaries, and the trick is to replace the inner products xi and X, X, xi transpose xj with kernel functions. So we're going to replace them with kernel functions, uh, which we haven't defined, but a kernel function is essentially a generalization of, a, of an inner product. And we'll, we'll, we'll formal, more formally define it later. Um, but basically, you replace you know, xi transpose xj with k of xi xj. And we replace it here as well, and we replace it there as well. And what we're left with is the kernel SVM, which is just like the dual SVM, but instead of the inner product of the data itself, we're going to use some other function that we've now abstracted away. That's the kernel function. So now that we've seen this, we you know the important question to ask next next is what is a kernel function? Um, so so let me try to define those. So a kernel function, like I said, is a generalization of inner products. Um, in partic in particular, you can think of it as inner products in some other space where you have this function phi uh, that takes in a data example, it takes in an xi or xj, uh, it takes an xi and it, and it outputs some other representation of xi in some other feature space. So it maps from the space of you know, x, the original space of x, which I've written as uh, curly x here, and it maps it to some other space z. So typically you know, we've been working with x's that live in, you know, rd, so the real vector space of dimensionality d. We've mostly been working with that. Um, but z could, be, z could be any other space, and, and it could even be rd. It could be the same space, um, and that, that's totally reasonable too. Um, but it could be something more complex like rd squared, so there's now, now d squared dimensions in this mapped space. Or it could be something totally weird, right, which is r to the infinity. So, the, so there's infinite values in the vector or in, infinite dimensions in the vector that describes each data point. And that's pretty weird, but the math still works because you know, when we think about these inner products, as long as we can find a way to compute the inner products, um, even, if we, if, even if that means we never explicitly represent the, the phi function, we can use the kernel directly. We can use this, the values that come out of the kernel function without having to compute the full inner products. Now these examples of different dimensionalities I, I gave you are, are motivated by popular kernels that people like to use in machine learning. So the first one is the most basic, is the linear kernel, where the feature map phi just outputs the original input. So it takes in a vector as input and it just outputs that same vector. And that's what, we've, that's what I'm, I've written here, uh, you know, phi of x is just x itself. And that's... If we plug that in, you can you can sort of see if you still remember what it looked like. That essentially what we did was replace all the inner products with this kernel function, and then now what this would do is is replace the kernel function with all the inner products. So the original linear SVM. So moving down to the other feature space I, I mentioned, the the d squared one, you can imagine an expansion of the features where you take every every feature and you also consider multiplying it by any all the other features. So we have you know x1 through xd; those are just the original original d-dimensional vector uh, features. But then we also have x1 times x1 uh, all the way through x1 times xd, uh, and we have xd times x1 all the way to xd times xd. So we so we have every possible combination of two features multiplied together, and 
that will get generate a space of, well, I guess I wrote rd squared, but it's really rd squared plus d. So that's a minor technicality. Uh, and then the last one, this infinite dimensional space representation is something where we take, we, we take something much more exotic, which is that we compute a feature value for the distance between each point and each other point. Or rather, since the phi function takes in some new data point x, it takes the distance from x to a bunch of other points, x1 through xn, uh, and then computes the you know uh, exponentiated squared distance between them. So this fancy feature map down here is going to be each dimension is going to be really high if that point is really close to its point to the dimensions you know xi point, um, and 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 it's going to be really low if you're really far away from that point. So these three. Feature maps are the linear feature map, the quadratic feature map, and the Gaussian radial basis function uh, feature map, or also known as the RBF feature map. So we'll think more about these, but for now, let's think about the linear feature map, even though it's so straightforward. Right? It's we ha it's like we haven't done anything, but 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 if anything anything that works for the linear feature map should work for any of these other feature maps. So. Um, when considering kernels, one of the important ideas is to think about something called the Gram matrix, or a Gram matrix, uh, or Gram matrices. And a Gram matrix is defined as the matrix of all the kernel values between every pair of points. So, you know, kij, the entry, I, the ijth entry in the Gram matrix, um, is going to be equal to the kernel value, uh, or, the, or the kernel function evaluated on xi and xj. So drawn out in a more expansive way, it looks like this, right? So, so you, at the top corner, you have x1 times, or you have phi of x1 times phi of x1, and the bottom corner, we have phi of xn times phi of xn, and then in between, you have all the different combinations of x1, x2, x3, etc. Um, and this can be written out really succinctly if you have, you know, a matrix representing all of your data or all of the mapped versions of your data. So you can write this equivalently as this outer product, right? not an inner product, but an outer product of the matrix representing your data in the mapped feature space. And because it's an outer product, we know that it's going to be positive semi-definite, which means that it has non-negative eigenvalues. And that, that will come in handy later, but for now, it's just think of it as a, a nice fact that we have. So returning to the linear kernel, remember if you know we get some data, an, an X matrix that's uh, that that where each column is you know a d-dimensional vector representing data point i, um, and our feature map is exactly just the identity function. It just takes the input and outputs the uh, outputs x. Then the Gram matrix for the linear kernel is exactly the well, I guess the inner product of the the data matrix uh, with itself. So this is another way of viewing how we, we, you know, with the linear kernel, all we've done is replace the inner products with a kernel function, which then get replaced back with um, the inner products. Okay, so to summarize, what we've talked about in this video is that the SVM primal problem has a dual optimization. And I, I mentioned in an aside that many, you know, a primal problem has many duals, but this is a just a particularly important dual that comes from the simplification of the Lagrangian. Okay, so the dual that we get has box constraints on the dual variables, so it's a very simple or simply constrained optimization, um, and it only considers inner products of data vectors. Right, it never looks at any other data vectors on its own. The optimization itself is only going to look at the inner products of more than one data vector, or two data vectors at a time. So that leads to the kernel trick, which is where we replace the inner products with kernel functions, which are going to be generalizations of inner products. And you can think of them as inner products mapped into feature space, uh, so some other feature space that may or may not be the same as the original input space. OK, so then next time, we're going to talk about how to efficiently compute polynomial and RBF kernels, um, which if we were to explicitly compute them, would have very large feature vectors. Right? When we do phi of x, we get very large feature vectors. But there's a, there's a, there are fast ways to compute the inner products without having to explicitly represent each of those features.